Good evening. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me here one year more to talk about neuroendocrine tumors. So I will try to do my best to create an algorithm with the evidence that we have today in small intestine neuroendocrine tumors. So these are my disclosures. Here you can see in this picture more or less what we have, the options that we have today to treat patients with, with advanced neuroendocrine tumors from the small intestinal origin. You can see here in blue the higher evidence in clinical trials, and in white the options that evidence is quite lower. I will try to go very quickly for each of these uh, treatments, and then at the end trying to create some kind of algorithm. So starting, of course, with somatostatin analogs. This has been the only option to treat our patients with advanced disease for many, many years. Uh, by the end of uh, 2000, we had the first prospective trial, the Prometheus study, that as you sure remember, this is the first study that randomized patients with advanced mid-gut carcinoids, the typical small intestine neuroendocrine tumors, to ocreotide or placebo, and this is the primary endpoint of the study. Sorry, of the study, this is time to progression, and the study was clearly positive, so this is, was the first time in a prospective way that somatostatin analogs demonstrated that they can control tumor growth in small intestine neuroendocrine tumors. But we had some limitations with the PROMIT study. Most of the patients, or all of them, were from mid-gut origin. Most of them had a low tumor burden in the liver, most of them less of 10% of liver involvement, 97% of them had G1 tumors, so this, is a, this means a key A67 less than 2%, and they treated functional and non-functional tumors, so patients with carcinoid syndrome and non-carcinoid syndromes. The limitations were mainly f to know what happened with, uh, with somatostin analogs in extra small intestine origins, mainly pancreatic uh, primary tumors, what happened with tumors with higher tumor burden in the liver, with higher Ki67, and with uh, those patients that, that had tumor progression at the beginning. Some of these questions were answered with a clarinet study. I remember you that this is a quite bigger study with more than 200 patients included. All of them were enteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, non-functioning, so no uh, hormone release, a clinically uh, detective hormone release, and patients were randomized to receive lanreotide or placebo during two years. And after that, all the patients received lanreotide until this is progression. The primary endpoint, you can see here, progression-free survival rate at two years, and you can see a clear advantage of the patients that receive lanreotide compared to placebo. This 40% increase in disease control rate at two years demonstrated that lanreotide were, was able to control disease progression in patients with gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, non-functioning, regardless the primary origin, and you can see here the, the subgroup analysis, uh, comparing mid-gut versus pancreas, high versus uh, low tumor burden, and G1 versus something so-called low G2 neuroendocrine tumors. This means that with a key A67 up to 10%. No differences in subgroup analysis. So we have octreotide and lanreotide to treat our patients with advanced neuroendocrine tumors of a small intestine origin in both situations, in carcinoid syndrome, uh, with carcinoid syndrome or without uh, functioning symptoms. Until last year, the end of last year, nothing else was really demonstrated benefit in tumor growth control in this setting. But two studies came at the end of last year. One, it was uh, the NETA one, just the reviewed by Professor Strasberg a few minutes ago, and the Radium 4 study. What happened with Ebrolimus in a small intestine neuroendocrine tumors? Uh, you should remember the, this presentation last ESMO meeting. It was, it was a, a, a plenary session where the results of the Radium 4 study were presented and discussed. This study included uh, more than 300 patients, all of them a small intestine or, or an, an gastroenteric origin and lung, and lung origin, non-functioning, so no uh, symptoms related to carcinoid syndrome, and patients were randomized to receive Everolimus alone, knowing combination with somatostatin analogs versus placebo. 
The study did not allow the, the crossover disease progression, and patients were all of them in resist progression during the last six months of follow-up. So this means that these were a real bad prognosis population. The primary endpoint of the study was clearly met, and here you can see the increase in progression-free survival uh, and the advantage of this near four months of the placebo arm up to 11 months of median PFS uh, reached by uh, Everolimus with a hazard ratio less than 0.5. And there were no differences in subgroup analysis, so this means that primary tumors from the lung compared to primary tumors of the GI tract were completely the same, so the Everolimus gave the same benefit in both uh, populations. Uh, I said before that the trial did not allow the crossover disease progression, so we have some trend in advantage in overall survival. This is not positive, but this is a trend. And I remember you, the, the radiant, the, the, the bad history of the unfortunate history of the radiant to study, to try to create my algorithm at the end of, of my talk. So if you remember, the radiant to study was a big phase three study for patients with extra pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, including lung and GI, uh, and they had symptoms of carcinoid disease. So this means some of the of the symptoms related with the carcinoid syndrome, diarrhea, or flushing, or something like that. The study randomized patients to receive Everolimus plus octreotide versus octreotide alone, thinking that octreotide alone could be the, the, the symptomatic arm, not the anti-tumoral effect of uh, octreotide. You can see that the study was nearly positive. By central review, the, the, the study did not reach the, the, the pre-specified p-value of 0.024, uh, uh, but it was a trend in the central review and in the, uh, in the, pen, in the, in the investigator assessment. So this means that probably for patients with carcinoid syndrome, these patients were not included in the radium 4 study. The combination of Eberolimus plus somatostin analogs could be an option in these patients with carcinoid syndrome after progression to somatostin analogs. Uh, of course, I will not review again the NETA1 trial, uh, only to remember you that this is the first international phase three study of PRT in neuroendocrine tumors of the GI tract. A couple of, of, of rememberings. Here you can see the primary uh, objective of the, of the trial, clearly increased the median progression free survival. And I remember you that this trial included patients with mid-gut carcinoids, the small intestine neuroendocrine tumor origin, all of them with uh, octroscan or somatostin receptor scintigraphy positive. And you can see here in the subgroup analysis that there were no differences in re regarding the intents of this uptake in the somatostin receptor scintigraphy, and neither you can see uh, differences in G1 patients compared with G2. Quickly going to the other uh, treatment options that have less evidence than these uh, four phase three uh, clinical studies. The first one, came from another big uh, clinical study carried in, in the US, the SWOG trial that was presented by James Yao last ASCO meeting. And this is a large phase three study with more than 400 patients included, patients with uh, neuroendocrine tumors of the small intestine origin with some characteristics of poor prognosis, um, quickly progressive with refractory carcinoid syndrome, with high tumor burden, or with G2 in, in the pathology report. And the patients were randomized to receive the experimental arm, bevacizumab plus octreotide, compared with the standard arm of uh, interferon plus uh, octreotide. The trial did not, met, did not meet the primary endpoint of the study, so the PFS was not increased in the bevacizumab plus octreotide arm. It was pretty the same, the median progression free survival. So, of course, bevacizumab is not an option for these patients. But interferon, it's like, um, it's like uh, having a better uh, support to be uh, administered in these patients with neuroendocrine tumors of the GI tract. So this means that uh, for the last studies that we had with interferon, that most of them were very old, only 
most, few of them randomized and with few number of patients. The effect of interferon to control the tumor growth was not very clear. But here, after this phase three study, we can see that we can control tumor growth up to 16 months of median progression of free survival in this group of patients with a special worse prognosis in, 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 from, uh, of, of patients with uh, primary tumors of, of the GI tract. What happens with interferon probably is the side effect profile. So it's not easy to manage the correct doses of interferon to try to avoid uh, and the side effects. And here you can see the, the reflect in time on treatment that was pretty shorter in the interferon arm compared to the bevacizumab arm. However, this had not an impact in median progression free survival. Going for the liver director uh, therapies, uh, if you look to the most updated guidelines, our INEDS guidelines uh, in the management of advanced neuroendocrine tumors, you can see in many different sites that local liver therapies are an option. And this means probably uh, the bulking surgery, radiofrequency, uh, embolization or chemoembolization. Chemo and you can see them in different sites of the algorithm uh, of the treatment of advanced neuroendocrine tumors. But if you go to the literature and try to find prospective, randomized clinical trials that try to assess the benefit in survival or in progression free survival of local liver therapies in neuroendocrine tumors, you will not find them. So you will find a lot of small studies, most of them single arm, few patients that suggest some responses in the liver, but the effect in progression free survival and in overall survival, it's not quite clear. And finally, what happens with chemotherapy? We have two scenarios of chemotherapy, one in the well-differentiated tumors and the other one in the poorly differentiated or the NAC, NAC G3. So we know that for patients with a small intestine neuroendocrine tumors, G1, G2, the typical carcinoid well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, chemotherapy does not work. And we have a lot of small studies, single drugs, and combination studies with few responses and with no impact in median survival. Something different happens with G3. We know that platinum-based chemotherapy probably is the best option for these patients. This, we cannot reach the same partial responses like in a small cell lung cancer, but we can see around 50% of partial responses with platinum-based chemotherapy in G3 neuroendocrine tumors with uh, a shorter survival, usually less than, than two years. But as was discussed before by Professor Rindy, it's all the group of patients included in the, this concept of neuroendocrine neoplasm, G3 neuroendocrine neo, neoplasm, are very high. So as you can imagine, patients with a KI67 of 21% will have a different prognosis than those patients with a KI67 of 99%. And we have more and more data that we can have more or less a cutoff maybe 40, 45, 50, 55% of ki 67 that can separate two different groups of patients, those patients with a better prognosis, with a lower ki 67 and those patients with a worse prognosis. And not only prognosis, but also predictive of response to chemotherapy. And you can see here in this, in this large series of more than 300 patients that chemo chemotherapy, platinum-based chemotherapy, can only reach a 15% of partial responses for those patients with a KI67 less than 55%. So what we can conclude about this final message, so we can treat our net G3 or type A and B of the Italian classification with the G2 approach. So this is something that happens, could not say often, but sometimes. Differentiation and proliferation are two different things. So ki 67 only measures the proliferation, and we can find and we can see patients with differentiation. This means that, for example, in this octroscan image, with uptake, so with, with expression of somatostatin receptors, but with a ki 67 over 20%. So this is the concept of, of this G3 neuroendocrine tumors, not neuroendocrine carcinomas. And we have a couple of experiences of new targeted agents in this setting, and this is uh, a French experience. 
presented this year at ASCO GI meeting, where sunitinib showed some uh, efficacy in this kind of patients, with a key age 67 cutoff of more or less 45 percent. Now, this is more or less the same what happened with Everolimus, and this was presented here a few months ago at the INEDS meeting, and you can see that Everolimus can control tumor growth in this group of net G3 patients, with median overall survivals quite interesting over 30 months. So my summary slide will be trying to define my, 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 my algorithm. So with those patients with a small intestine neuroendocrine neoplasms, G1, G2, first of all, we need to treat symptoms related to carcinoid disease. And this is quite clear that somatostatin analogs are the first option. When somatostatin analogs fail, it's, uh, it's not so clear, so we have evidence of combining interferon with somatostatin analogs, and this can increase the control at least with uh, the biomarkers that we have in blood and in urine and some symptoms. And probably in the near future, uh, we can, we'll have also telotristat for, for controlling diarrhea. In this case, local liver therapies, the bulking surgery, embolization, probably more than chemo embolization, can help, but we don't have real uh, evidence-based medicine to say that this is the best option for these patients. What happens when we, when we try to target tumor growth? So I think that we, with the results of the phase three studies that we have, we have two main group of patients, those that we don't know if they are in disease progression or not, or if they are on a stable disease. So these were the patients included in the clarinet study. So uh, in my opinion, this G1 low G2 with a key I67 less than 10%, stable disease, no evidence of disease progression by resist, Somatostin analogs are the first option, more than wait and, watch and wait or wait and see. So we have prospective trials with somatostin analogs, and we don't have prospective trials with watch and wait. After disease progression, with G1, G2, and up to 20%, up to today we have two different options. And in my opinion, I, we cannot compare the radian 4 and the net on one study. So we have Everolimus alone for non-functioning tumors and lutetium, lutatera, for those patients with octroscan positive or somatostin receptor scintigraphy positive studies and um, techniques. For those patients that are functioning, I think that we have enough support from the, coming from the radian to study to combine Everolimus with somatostin analogs in this setting after progression to the other two strategies of somatostin analogs and uh, lutatera. We don't have data of sequential therapies. Uh, the, the INEDS and the Spanish group is carrying now the, the sector study in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but we don't have sequential studies in small intestine neuroendocrine tumors. But most of patients will receive one treatment first and then the other one. So we need to keep an eye on those patients with a late toxicity of combining both therapies in the, in the course of the disease. And in gray here, you can see the less evidence data. So we have the combination of interferon and somatostin analogs coming from the SWOC uh, trial. At least we have a phase three study with more than 400 patients included. We have also the local regional liver therapies. Not sure about controlling disease at the long term. And maybe chemotherapy for those patients with high ki 67 more, more near than those net G3 than for those net G1, maybe it's an option when the tumor is the differentiating and growing more quickly. For patients with neuroendocrine neoplasm G3, this big group of patients, I think in my opinion that we need to separate the neck G3 versus the neck net G3. For really G3 neuroendocrine carcinomas, rapidly progressive, ki 67 probably up to or over 50%, Chemotherapy and probably platinum-based chemotherapy is the best option at, at the beginning. For those patients that are in the middle of this G2 and high G3 neuroendocrine carcinomas, I think that we need to be inventive, so we need to, to change our mentality to be modern and to try to treat our patients not only with the key A67 value, but also with the differentiation. And the experience is more and more there that these patients can be managed with different uh, therapies, not only cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And on time, I finished. Thank you so much.